Well, greetings fellow Dwarfers. Welcome back to my episode breakdowns. Today, season two, episode one, Crichton. Now, I'm not gonna lie, this is probably one of my favorite series. Series two is just, it's got all the best stuff of season one, that kind of really cool, old school aesthetic. It's got Norman Lovett as Holly. It's got that really kind of early vibe, but they just start pushing the boundaries a bit more. The writers get more adventurous. The production goes up a step. I really like season two. And while the look of the show remains kind of the same, it's all the same sets. The way the sets were lit and color was brought in and they just took everything up a level. Really just sort of moves it away from that deep submarine aesthetic into something just really cool and kind of sets the show up for how it's gonna look in series three, four, five. It really sort of sets up just a quality look. I just really like this series. And I love what the writers were doing, starting to give us the backstories for Rimmer and Lister, starting to kind of explore what they could do. Yeah, I love it. And it got off to a bang with Crichton. This is a great first episode. Let's dive in and have a look at it. So this week, the Holly opening gag is that we're in a meaningless universe, but you've got to laugh. We then get an exterior view of the crashed Nova 5 sitting on an asteroid or moon or somewhere at some strange awkward angle. We'll later see that all the interior sets as well were made to have that same slope to them. And while on the asteroid, the ship seems to be sending out an audible distress signal. So does that mean there's a bit of an atmosphere for the sound to travel through? Would that make this a planet rather than an asteroid or a moon? Maybe. We then join Crichton inside watching Androids, a deliberately sh shockingly rubbish looking Mickey take Aussie soap opera with the Australian accents, the really naff rickety looking sets. Uh, you've got a wonderful moment of a boom in, you know, microphone sticking into the top of shot. It's a brilliant, deliberately rubbish looking mini episode within the episode Crichton. So we see Crichton watching this terrible looking soap opera with a box of chocolates next to him and what I thought at first was maybe a cigar in his hand but I think it more likely is just like a chocolate finger. Then Androids ends with a brilliantly blatant Mickey Take uh, theme tune that is blatantly just a perfect mix of Neighbours and Home and Away's theme tunes. Absolutely genius. You can really hear the crowd laughing at this one because it's such a recognisable kind of cheesy tune. And for those of you who want to hear more of it, disturbing as that might seem, you can go check out the deleted scenes and watch an even longer version of like the whole theme tune that's like 30, 40 seconds long. Go check out the deleted scenes if you want to hear the whole thing. And during the closing credits for Androids, we get the first of two Gareth Gwenlin references in this episode, with Androids having been apparently produced by Kylie Gwenlin. For those who don't know, Gareth Gwenlin was the head of BBC Comedy at this time and had rejected Red Dwarf a couple of times, which is why the writers decided to slightly childishly poke a bit of fun at him in this episode. We then leave Crichton just where he is and join the Dwarfers back on Red Dwarf, with Rimmer trying to learn the language Esperanto while Lister sits around polishing his space bike. Esperanto is a real-ish language. It does exist, you can go Google it, find out more about it. Uh, it was intended to be an international language and it was it's only about 100 years old, but no country actually speaks it. Uh, so I'm not gonna say it's pointless, but... Anyhow, the fact that it's supposed to be an international language that's easy to learn makes it even more funny that Rimmer has been studying it for eight years and is still absolutely useless at it. Lister keeps interrupting with the correct answers, having managed to learn Esperanto like a passive smoker from all of Rimmer's failed attempts. Rimmer quips that Lister hasn't read any books, to which Dave says he has, although back in Future Echoes, it was Dave that said I'd never read a book. Rimmer also says that we're not talking about books where the main character is a dog called Ben. We'll come back to that later. Lister talks about having been to art college for 97 minutes, something we'll hear referenced plenty of times throughout the years of Red Dwarf. And it's a good example of how series two, the writers were starting to reveal more of the characters' backstories. Holly then interrupts the lesson before Rimmer fails to insult him in Esperanto. 
Holly claims to have decimalised music and tries to give the musical scale, but in monotone, so every note sounds exactly the same. Holly also eventually reveals that they're getting a signal, to which Rimmer once more gets excited about the possibility of it being aliens, similar to his excitement over the garbage pod in Waiting for God. The boys then find the cat in the hallway, the famous studio lighting gantry, and tell him that they're getting the signal. Now while this is just an 18 second long, kind of forgettable, just look, little kind of passing scene, Originally, there was a much longer, much more elaborate version. Go check out the deleted scenes. There's this whole thing of the cat, the toaster, and the scutters trying to perform a cat song. It's awful, it's all screamy, um, with, with Danny John Jules doing a brilliant impression of the kind of noise you'd hear from cats screaming in the middle of the night. It's absolutely terrible, but pretty funny. Go check it out. It's a bit weird because there's none of the toaster parts recorded, so it's just silent. But go check it out. It's interesting to see how this was a much longer scene before where the guys would then come in and interrupt him and say that they're getting a signal. We then enter the first properly new bit of Red Dwarf set for this series, a heavily redesigned and redressed drive room. With far more colour and downlight firing through the ceiling grates, it's got much more of the look we're accustomed to of Red Dwarf in future years. And while it might seem to sort of break canon just suddenly changing the drive room for no reason, the show creators are pretty clever with this. They changed all the numbers on the corridor so that we're on a different level of the ship. So this could be a backup drive room or a secondary drive room. The tongue-tied wiki page puts that maybe it was just closer to the living quarters and made more sense for the guys to use. I'd go with that. I don't think this one breaks canon at all. We get the brilliant dog's milk last ages because no bugger will drink it gag before finally getting that distress call from Crichton aboard the Nova 5. Crichton appeals for help to save the three remaining crew members, all of whom are women, much to the delight of the Dwarfers. Chris Barry's impersonation talents come into play as he makes himself sound like a brave captain, before then sounding like some old cheap advert. With one day to prepare, the boys set to work getting ready for their first encounter with a woman in over three million years. This gives us the legendary Lister dressing scene, which includes such delights as him hammering some flex back into his socks and spray painting his own ass. He's also wearing a Muggs Murphy t-shirt, a fictional in-universe character we saw in the cinema scene from Me Squared. Rimmer arrives in full dress uniform, which we also saw in the previous episode, Me Squared. After a humorous chat, Rimmer wants Lister to call him either Big Man or Ace in front of the women, and to big up the fact that he's very brave and that he's had tons of girlfriends. All of which is kind of nonsense, of course. As a parting gift, Rimmer convinces Lister to wear his day glow orange moon boots, which are utterly disgusting. We then jump back to the Nova 5, where Crichton is feverishly dusting, cleaning, and watering his many hanging baskets. A subtle hint about his upcoming dream to have his own garden. Now is probably a good time to mention David Ross playing the part of Crichton here, rather than the more familiar Robert Llewellyn we see from Series 3 onwards. I'll cover why David wasn't brought back for Series 3 when we get to Series 3, but as a well-seasoned, experienced actor, David Ross was well liked by the entire cast and crew, who really liked his ability to work with an audience. We did get to see, or rather hear, David again in the future, as he played the talkie toaster from here on. If you want to hear my in-universe theory for why the uh, Crichton character changed so much, check out my Crichton swap video, which I'll put a link to up here somewhere. We then get the brilliant reveal that the three injured crew members are long, long past saving being merely well-tended and well-groomed skeletons. It's about Niall that the penny should be dropping that Crichton's a bit... quirky. We then get to see the boys on board Blue Midget. This is our first time seeing Blue Midget in the show. Lister's wearing those disgusting moon boots and they're literally steaming with filth. And coming back to that reference of Dave reading books about a dog called Ben, he is reading a book, but it's not a dog called Ben. It's a dog called Spot. Rimmer is impatient to go, but Lister wants to see the result of the cat spending 24 hours rampantly grooming. To which we're presented 
with the delightful sight of a gold spacesuit with cufflinks and a massive helmet that won't mess up his hair. Cat apparently made the suit himself, which to say that's impressive is a massive understatement, given that NASA just blew $420 million and a decade's work only to decide to give up on making their own spacesuits in the future. The next delightful sight is of Holly wearing a terrible looking toupee. And we get the comical reference to the fact that Rimmer is wearing two pairs of presumably holographic socks, one on his feet and one down his trousers. Once on board the Nova 5 we get the classic gag of the cat being obsessed by a mirror and having to literally be dragged away, before Rimmer kind of shoots himself in the foot by quoting Esperanto, but of course Kryson is fluent in Esperanto and kind of pulls him up on it. And of course we now get the big reveal, well for the Dwarfers anyway, that they're walking into a dining room apparently pulled from a Hammer House of Horrors. I love how Lister takes the opportunity to poke fun at Rimmer by for a change, doing exactly what he was told to do. Calling him ace, calling him big man, mentioning his bravery and saying he's had tons of girlfriends. Interestingly, when Rimmer makes the funny gag about Crichton being the android version of Norman Bates, he reveals that they have been in space for three million and two years. Kind of implying that this is two years after Dave was let out of stasis. Crichton returns and the boys inform him that the girls are dead giving us one of my favourite lines. Well, I was only away two minutes. Not necessarily a killer line on paper, but with David Ross's fantastic comedy timing, it became a brilliant, memorable moment. Lister suggests that the first thing they should do is bury the women. Although in The Promised Land from 2020 in Lister's pile of junk, it appears that that didn't happen and it's Lister that held on to one of these skeletons. So it's kind of funny that he's the one who suggests it. Back on Blue Midget, the Dwarfers and Crichton head to Red Dwarf. Along the way, Crichton despairs that his function is to serve, yet he has now no masters. Along the way, he says the classic, I haven't got the software to cope with this, which has become my go-to meme just about every time I look at the news these days. On Red Dwarf, Rimmer puts Crichton to task with a ridiculously long to-do list. In the bunk room, Crichton is sewing and appears to be mending something, which I'm pretty sure must be Dave's iron burnt trousers from earlier. The bunk room itself has been completely redressed with wallpaper, pot plants and plenty of doilies. Dave and Crichton then discuss how Crichton's been having dreams of planting his own garden, and Dave encourages him to go find a planet and do just that, before the subject of Mr Rimmer comes up. But Dave thinks he doesn't deserve to be called Mr. Rimmer, he deserves to be called things like Smeghead, Dinosaur Breath, Molecule Mind and Asshole. Sometime later, in the bunk room, everyone is together as Crichton paints a portrait of Rimmer in his full white uniform. During the discussions, Lister calls Crichton a total Gwendolyn, giving us our second reference. After a discussion about Dave taking Crichton to see rebellious movies in order to inspire his independent side, Dave despairs that they seem to have made no difference. We then finally get the reveal showing Crichton's painting, which perfectly captures Rimmer's authority, his senior JMC position, his incredible ability to be in charge of things, and the fact that he might just be crapper of the year. It's a fantastic painting, I absolutely love it. One of my favourite things in Red Dwarf, definitely one of my favourite props. Crichton then gives his full rebellion speech, destroys Rimmer's bunk with a load of soup, gives a load of insults to Rimmer before finally giving him the finger. The episode then ends with Crichton getting onto Dave's space bike, presumably to go off and find a fertile planet that he can make his garden on. In the remastered versions we remarkably get a bit of footage that is actually good. Remarkably, it's uh, an extra bit of footage of Crichton driving forward on the space bike before blasting off into space. Now this is original footage because back in the day the props department did make a really cool extra big space bike that could ride around. So it's cool to see this original bit of footage. It's a remastered change that I actually quite like. Remarkable. <laughs>
Now throughout all of this, what I haven't mentioned is the appearances of the Nova 5 and Crichton in the books, especially Infinity Welcomes Careful Drivers, where the Nova 5 and Crichton do feature heavily. I haven't mentioned these because the story in the books is really very different and quite hard to tie in with this episode directly. There is some cool background given in the book, like the Nova 5, the reason it crashes in the book is because Crichton is so cleaning obsessed that he actually cleans the inside of the navigation computer with soap and water and fries it, causing the ship to crash. So there's some cool background given, but beyond that, the stories really do differ quite a lot. So that's Crichton, a brilliant season opener with some great memorable moments. I love the reveal of the uh, dead crew members. I love the uh, the whole, you know, I've only been away two minutes. And of course, that amazing reveal of that really brilliant painting. It's a great episode, loads of memorable moments. I really like this one. Definitely one of my favorite episodes from season two, but that's kind of a silly thing to say because I really like season two. I'm going to end up saying this is my favourite quite a lot. Guys, let me know what you think of Crichton. Is this a top episode for you? If so, let me know in the comments what you like, what you dislike. Hope you guys enjoyed this breakdown. More coming soon. Hit subscribe if you haven't done so already. Give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed this one. And I'll see you next time, Smegheads.